Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us. My name's Becky Elwell and I'm the Macmillan Lymphedema Advanced Nurse Practitioner from the Royal Stoke University Hospital, which is part of the University Hospitals of North Midlands NHS Trust. And I'm a very proud trustee of the British Lymphology Society. And I'd like to thank Legs Matter for the opportunity um, to speak today. So um, I've been given the honour of talking about a subject that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I hope that uh, I can share some of my experiences related to it. Um, and I really hope that you will um, get your questions in um, using the Q&A function or the chat function um, so that we can have uh, a question and answer session uh, following the presentation. So I'm just going to start to share um, the presentation now. So this session is entitled What to do about red legs? Next slide, please. This is just some of the examples of um, people who we see and some clinical photography of red legs, just to highlight what we mean, that there's various different shades of redness um, and various different connotations depending on how your legs look. Next slide, please. So what we're often asked as practitioners is what's the difference between cellulitis and permanently or chronic long-term redness in the legs. So hopefully let's clear this up um, at the start. So cellulitis, it's an infection um, caused by bacteria um, and under the skin or in the tissues just below the skin, which causes people to have a very high temperature and to feel acutely unwell. So with shivers um, and um, sometimes nausea. Um, very, very acute, so comes on quickly, um, and the redness uh, will be painful, associated with pain. And it's usually one leg or lower limb, uh, but it can be anywhere at all on the body. You can have warmth, so a feeling of heat to the area. Some people say like you could fry an egg on it, um, and tenderness with or without skin blistering. The blood tests that you may undergo if it's thought that you have cellulitis may confirm that an infection is present and there may be a port of entry into the skin for that bacteria from the outside, for example, a break or an insect bite um, or an infection uh, like a fungal infection like athlete's foot um, or there may not be. So we'll, we'll touch on that as well. There is a very strong link with lymphedema, which I'm going to talk about. And cellulitis will require treatment with antibiotics. And for some people, this will need to be intravenous, so via a needle into the vein, rather than in tablet form, depending on the severity. So if you think that you are suffering from cellulitis, then you must seek medical advice, uh, either from your GP um, or walk-in centre or 111. But if you are acutely unwell, then you must go to your A&E department. If one leg is red and very painful um, and hot, um, but actually you don't feel unwell, this still requires medical attention as there could be possibly be a deep vein thrombosis, DVT or blood clot in the leg. So this also needs a medical examination. But many people have redness throughout both their legs, usually below the knee only. There can be associated warmth and tenderness, so it might still feel hot to touch and be tender. Um, but generally, you feel the same as you usually do. You don't feel unwell in yourself. Um, and if we were to look at our temperature, it would not be raised. And this redness is not as a result of bacteria, but due to chronic inflammation, chronic inflammatory changes, which are due to problems with the skin or the veins. And it doesn't matter how many courses of antibiotic therapy you have, it's not going to respond. So if you've had leg redness that's been treated with antibiotic therapy um, with little or no improvement, then it's likely that the redness is not cellulitis, but actually is red leg syndrome. So this session is hopefully for you. Next slide, please. So this is to show a picture of uh, one leg with acute cellulitis. The redness is extending into the foot and on the lower leg. And you can see there's a plaster on the toe there indicating there has been some trauma. But as I said, there isn't always an obvious 
entry point for the bacteria into the skin. And then the picture uh, under the heading red legs is showing uh, both legs being very red and very inflamed. Next slide, please. So in lymphedema, lymphedema is chronic or long-term swelling um, and lymphedema is due to a failure in your lymphatic system. So the lymph system is the lymph glands in your neck and under your arms and in your groin and then thousands of little lymph vessels connect those up and it's a transport system. It also processes fat from the gut and it fights infection or helps us to fight infection. So unsurprisingly, if we have swelling, which is showing a failure in our lymph system, we are more at risk of infection and cellulitis is the most common of those. The fluid that's within the tissues when they're swollen, so if you have ankle or leg swelling, that fluid is rich in protein molecules, which encourages bacterial growth. So that certainly doesn't help. And then also that presence of fluid or swelling inactivates the normal antimicrobial properties of our skin, lowering our ability to resist and fight infection. So if we get a scratch, an insect bite um, or uh, an infection, uh, then we may find it harder if we have swelling to deal with that. Next slide, please. In lymphedema, when we have chronic or long term swelling, cellulitis can behave differently to if you don't have swelling. So the onset can be quite unusual or what we call atypical and it can be fast. So sometimes patients with swelling will develop an episode of cellulitis within an hour. Cellulitis is both a cause and a complication of lymphedema, hence the chicken and the egg. We don't know whether there was a predisposition to infection by having a reduced transport capacity within the lymph system. So we were prone to getting cellulitis and then that caused an increase in swelling, which persists. Or was there no failure of the lymph system and no swelling prior to the cellulitis, but this infection overwhelmed the lymphatic system and resulted in a long term swelling. So as with lots of medical conditions, there is nothing clear cut. 46% of patients with lymphedema will get cellulitis. And in 2019, a study in Norfolk um, of people going to hospital with suspected cellulitis, 37% of the caseload also had lymphedema. So it's, it's definitely um, a very strong link there. There's a, a statement there that says compression question mark, and that refers to whether compression uh, stockings or wraps or bandaging can be used in cellulitis. Previously, um, it was thought that this uh, wearing of compression could spread the infection uh, either up a leg or spread it onto the body. But actually, what we know is this is unlikely to be the case. And if pain is tolerable, then you can continue with compression. There's a document shown here, which is the British Lymphology Society and Lymphedema Support Network consensus document for the management of cellulitis in lymphedema, because it's slightly different to get treatment for cellulitis if you have lymphedema as well. So this document can help to support your GP or your practice nurse or your healthcare professional at a walk-in centre or out of hours unit to actually give you the right antibiotic therapy in a timely fashion and to extend that course of antibiotics for the correct period of time. So if you're somebody who's had cellulitis or you have lymphedema and are at risk of cellulitis, this can be an important document and you can find it at the British Lymphology Society website and we can put a link in the chat uh, for you. Next slide, please. Recurrent cellulitis is when you have more than one, uh, sorry, more than two attacks in a 12 month period. Um, and this is something that would be not unheard of in patients with lymphedema. But actually, it's something that we hear many patients say to us um, with red leg syndrome that they've had five or more episodes of recurrent cellulitis over a three or four month period. And at that point, we should be scratching our heads and thinking, was this actually cellulitis? Was it one leg that was affected or two? And if it was two, it's unlikely that it was cellulitis. If there is a genuine cellulitis 
uh, with or without lymphedema present. It may be necessary to look at prevention of any uh, further episodes. So if a skin condition persists, for example, eczema, psoriasis or athlete's foot and it has not previously been addressed, then this is very important and you should seek advice from your GP or practice nurse or pharmacist and it may be that a referral to dermatology is necessary. For patients with lymphedema who have two genuine attacks of cellulitis or more in a year, then prophylactic or preventative antibiotics may be indicated. So this is a low dose of antibiotic that's taken daily to ensure um, further attacks are prevented and to avoid further damage to the lymph system. Next slide, please. So red legs, they cause misery, debility and worry. They cause pain and discomfort, tenderness, burning, throbbing sensations. It causes skin sensitivity. So the skin appears shiny and thin. And sometimes some of the treatments we use for red legs, including steroid creams, can make this worse. And we'll touch on that later. There's also a fear of knocking the legs or ulceration or breaking the skin um, because of that uh, acute redness. The legs are often described as looking so angry. An intense sensation of heat. So um, a sensation of being unable to stand anything on the legs. So like the bedclothes and people stop wearing socks or um, tights or um, compression um, and actually it just feels like um, you couldn't stand to, to have anything on. People use plant sprays with cool water in or cold compresses to try and calm the legs down and some people find that um, moisturising their legs seems to feed the redness or to make the redness worse. If you also have lymphedema and red legs. There's um, usually a, a, a sensation our patients describe of a bursting and increased risk of leakage of lymph through the skin, um, which we call lymphorrhea, loss of lymph fluid through the skin. This is a clear fluid um, which can spring a leak uh, spontaneously and is more common where the skin is thin and red. Next slide, please. The use of language is really important. So I'm talking about red legs throughout this presentation, but actually it can be much harder to see redness in dark skin. So we do need to be mindful of listening to what you tell us if you are a patient or listening to our patients about the changes that you are seeing and feeling within your tissues. Um, and watch out for an exciting new document um, from Wounds UK to help change our practice and to educate um, around our use of language. Next slide, please. So, as with our Legs Matter message this week, it's time to take charge. You have the power. If your legs are red, and it's both legs, then you may have tried antibiotics already, or you may actually be able to avoid unnecessary antibiotics. And if you don't feel that you're getting the help that you need, this hopefully will make a real difference to you. Next slide, please. This is the Red Legs Pathway. So this was primarily devised by the University Hospital of North Midlands um, with my Red Leg Service. Um, and it was a pathway to look at uh, any leg redness. So whether it was in one leg or whether it was in two. And the pathway is designed to work through um, to show the cause for the redness um, and to help manage the redness. So the pathway has been um, adopted by the British Lymphology Society. You can find this at their website. Um, and um, it's now been adopted um, and in, sorry, adopted by uh, BLS and uh, endorsed by the Legs Matter campaign. We're, we're delighted that this will be displaying the Legs Matter um, logo soon. So this document could be helpful for you to take with you um, as a patient or if you're a healthcare professional to display in your waiting areas um, and to educate your team members and colleagues with about treating and managing red legs. So there are many different causes for why the redness may be present um, and there are some simple guidance for improving um, the symptoms and making it more comfortable uh, to live with. So we're going to go through some of the common um, causes now. Um, this pathway um, will enable you, if you are a patient, to be a real red leg champion um, and a red leg ambassador. So don't settle for redness in your legs. Next slide, please. 
So one of the most common causes of red legs is lipodermatosclerosis. So lipodermatosclerosis um, is extremely painful, um, especially uh, when it first starts. Um, and it's uh, when the tissue um, actually draws in or is shrinking in the lower aspect of the leg. And in this picture, you can see the redness that's very, very acute and associated with this condition. And then later on, the second picture shows a more established lipodermatosclerosis where the uh, redness is paler, more dull, um, and not associated with that heat to touch, um, and much more comfortable at this stage. But certainly you can understand at the onset when the skin is so red, inflamed, angry, painful, that infection is a common thought that that might be the case. And sometimes antibiotics may be provided just in an attempt to improve those symptoms but actually that wouldn't be the right treatment. So we know that some people will have swelling um, or lymphedema along with lipodermatosclerosis. Um, there's a common term that's been used to describe it of an upside down champagne bottle uh, where we have the narrowing at the lower aspect of the leg and then the enlargement of the calf. And there can also be staining, which you can see in the second picture, what we call hemosiderin staining, um, which is a brownish discoloration of the skin and shows that the veins underneath are not working as well as they could be. Next slide, please. Another common cause of redness in the legs is varicose eczema or gravitational dermatitis as it can be caused. This is a condition again caused by the veins not working as well as they could when increased pressure in the veins overwhelms the little valves and the veins fail we see some backflow or reflux um, into the tissues and that then it is thought causes an immune reaction um, so the body reacts to the fluid being there. The skin can be itchy, red, swollen, dry and scaly and there may not be any associated warmth, but there can be for some people. There may also be some associated hemosiderin staining we mentioned previously, some thread or spider veins. Um, and this may be an association. So it's possible to have lipodermatosclerosis and varicose eczema and atrophy blanches where there has been a previous uh, healed ulcer. It's almost a very um, scarred or changed area of skin. So this can be another explanation for redness in the legs. Next slide, please. Contact dermatitis, not as common as the other two, but certainly we do see it. So it's a type of eczema that's um, a, a result of a contact to a particular substance. So there can be blistering um, and itching, redness and dryness, um, and scratching will then lead to broken skin and then infection can occur. So it's important to uh, use fragrance-free emollient, but it can be um, so bad that we need a referral to dermatology for patch testing to take place to see if we can identify the substance that's causing the contact. Very occasionally, we've seen patients with red legs below the knee, and it's been as a result of a bandage component. So the redness um, has had a very clear line um, around the uh, top of the leg below the knee, um, and that's actually shown uh, up as a, as a contact dermatitis. Next slide, please. So fungal infections, very, very common athlete's foot or its uh, real name is tinea pedis. It's very contagious and it causes extreme itching um, and redness, often in between the toes, just along the toes on the top of the foot and to the sole of the foot. The skin uh, can become dry and red um, and it can blister and you get these white cracks in between the toes often. There's a fungal infection called intertrigo as well, which can um, occur in the creases, deepened creases um, that are seen in lymphedema, um, where we get misshaping of the legs with the swelling. And sometimes um, when we have skin on skin, so for example, in the groin behind the knee um, and in um, our um, patients who are carrying extra weight. Next slide, please. So we've also seen heat-induced redness in the red leg service. So uh, we have seen patients with um, sunburn or exposure to radiators or open fires. Um, and again, this is something that usually demarcation lines from clothing um, or footwear can help us to, um, to sort out. Next slide. 
So how can you take charge and get your spark back? How can you treat your red legs and get the care that you need? Next slide, please. So skincare is the most important component. And the good news is whatever the cause of the redness, the treatment is the same. So the legs should be washed daily with a soap substitute and dried thoroughly, especially in between the toes or into any skin folds. Moisturising should take place, even if this appears to um, make the redness worse, using a bland emollient. So remember, not one cream suits everyone. Some people have allergies or sensitivities to certain creams. Um, and we should always be aware of paraffin based products because they are flammable. Using antipyritic creams, so these are creams that contain an anti-itch if the legs itch can be really beneficial. There are a number of these, including Balneum and E45 itch relief cream, and consider antihistamines if you're able to take them. It can break the itch scratch cycle. Potent steroid ointments can be applied to the affected areas but only for short periods. And um, after this, the potency of the steroid ointment should be reduced. Um, it's important that um, sometimes we adjust these timings. So if you've been told by a healthcare professional to use the products for longer, then that's fine. Um, but it must be short periods um, in the main part. And steroid ointments should be applied 30 minutes after you've moisturised. It's really important as well to highlight that there is some emerging evidence that steroid creams or ointments can actually cause red legs if they're used incorrectly or in the long term. So we certainly don't want to add to that. If there are fungal infections present, drying thoroughly is the key. And we know that it can be really difficult if it's hard to reach the legs and feet. Separate towels should be used for the individual with the fungal infection. And it is possible to purchase long handled cotton buds now, which can be really good for drying in between toes. Clean socks or compression hosiery must be applied daily. And using an antifungal cream like Lamisil is the key. Inside of shoes, if they're leather, should be disinfected when they're not worn. And if possible, although footwear is a huge bugbear for patients with uh, swelling and lymphedema, but if possible, to rotate shoes. Next slide, please. Exercise. So we know that we're all leading a more sedentary lifestyle with lockdown, but we want to encourage as much walking as possible. That may be with a walking aid or without. Encouraging as much activity as we can do when we're sitting down. Chair-based exercises should be carried out up to five times a day. That might be with a specific piece of equipment like a pedal machine, or it may actually be just doing some simple chair-based exercises. There's an excellent um, set of resources on the Legs Matter website. Um, and also NHS.UK um, has um, a, a really good uh, chair-based exercises video. Get family and carers involved, make it fun. There are lots of online um, yoga and Pilates sessions for every age and every ability on the internet, uh, on the internet, sorry, and positioning of the red areas is really important. So when sitting for periods of time, try and elevate the legs if possible um, and always make sure um, that you're going to bed overnight. And if you're caring for someone um, or as a healthcare professional um, and people are struggling to go to bed overnight, that's something that needs addressing. So it may be possible to look at getting um, a hospital bed at home. The Everybody Can campaign from the British Lymphology Society has loads of resources to get you out and about or to get you more active in the home. Finding uh, three minutes to do something regularly throughout the day and finding your secret weapon to exercise. So have a look at the uh, BLS website. Next slide, please. Compression is the mainstay of red leg management. So we usually look at an underlayer next to the skin, which can be calming. Um, for example, a silk um, stockinette. Um, and these um, are available on prescription in some instances. They can, these can be used alone um, to start with um, to actually build up some um, tolerance of wearing something on the legs if that has felt completely overwhelming to start with. Or they can be used in association um, with compression. If only low strength garments are required, liners could be utilised or sometimes we have um, garments that just have compression to the feet um, and then a leg wrap to the leg itself. And then if it's compression uh, stockings that are required, then um, they can be used uh, without um, a 
test, an AVPI test to check um, that you have good blood flows in the absence of red flags. And these can be um, identified in the information that's within the Legs Matter website and on the National Wound Care Strategy um, documentation, recommendations for lower limb care. If there's no swelling, then generally we only need light compression. Um, however, in patients with lipodermatosclerosis or with lymphedema, it may be necessary um, to have a slightly higher level of compression in order to achieve the desired results. But it may need to be slowly titrated. So starting with a lighter garment, moving up to a heavier garment. Next slide, please. And healthy eating. Remember to maintain a healthy body weight, reducing weight if necessary, um, and referring um, on either be our, through our GP or through your healthcare professional. Or uh, if we're healthcare professionals, then knowing how to get patients move through the system to get dietetic support. Um, some prescribed weight loss uh, programs are out there, and also it may be necessary to um, instigate a bariatric referral if necessary. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a whistle-stop tour of Red Legs, um, and I really hope that's been useful. I hope that you've shared any questions with us, um, and it would be really nice um, to uh, ask you to go to the um, website, legsmatter.org, um, to check out the resources um, where the Red Legs pathway is also. So um, we've had a question from Hannah um, saying, what BLS documents do I uh, most need to be aware of as a DN? Um, and that's a, a district nurse. And so um, the documents that would be the most helpful resources um, for community teams um, from the BLS, I would say, would be the Red Legs pathway that we've talked about. There's also um, a document uh, which supports the application of compression in the absence of a Doppler test um, or an ABPI, an ankle brachial pressure index. This is a measurement that's done um, around the ankles with using a blood pressure cuff um, and then um, looking at whether a patients are suitable for compression. Um, so the document supports applying compression without one of these tests, which is not um, historically, that hasn't historically been the case. Um, so um, I think those two are the key. And there's a new document that was launched in October at our conference, um, the BLS conference, which is uh, about um, caring for um, the swollen leg. So a lymphedema with a deep vein thrombosis um, and um, around the questions about the application of compression and when to apply compression if you've had a deep vein thrombosis. But there's loads of resources about looking after your skin. There's resources that explain the difference between lymphedema and lipedema. There are numerous fact sheets relating to every aspect of lymphedema management and the Everybody Can campaign information. So get on there, uh, uh, bls.co.uk uh, um, and find all those uh, resources waiting for you as well as the ones on the on the legs matter site so we've had a question um as well um saying that um my partner's mum has red legs swelling and has suffered several episodes of cellulitis. She's been prescribed compression stockings, but only for one leg, despite the fact that the other leg is swollen and red with red brown staining. Should we go back to her clinician and ask why? What an excellent question. So this um, is actually highlighting a common problem where um, only one leg receives care. And this happens quite commonly in the community. Um, if we have um, a patient with a leg ulcer, for example, on their left leg, then inevitably all the care will be directed to the left leg while the right leg is ignored. So um, the answer simply is yes. It's really important to find out why the um, untreated leg is swollen and affected with the redness. You uh, have stated there's a reddish brown staining, so it may be indicating that the veins are not working as well as they could be. And certainly uh, prevention is better than cure. So it would be really important to get um, some healthcare advice to start moving forward um, on a pathway of care. In the meantime, don't wait for that to start uh, washing with a soap substitute, drying thoroughly, applying a moisturiser and exercising. All of those things can be done immediately without delay, making sure that the leg is elevated during periods of rest um, and obviously trying to um, address weight if, if weight is an issue. But I think that this is, is very important that we should always be looking at both legs and both feet. 
So I think that's all the questions that we've had now. Um, I hope it's been useful. Um, we've had some lovely comments. So thank you very much. Um, and do visit uh, the rest of the sessions in the live lounge. There's some really exciting stuff coming up. So I hope you thoroughly enjoy those. Thank you very much indeed.